Okay. Uh, there's no lead-in music today, and there's only one camera working. They uh, fried something back there in the control room. So anyway, uh, the introduction is going to be just me and what I have written up here. So what we're going to do today, the emphasis today is going to be moving into a new area, something brand new for most of you called polar coordinates and then how to do graphs in polar coordinates and then why we want to learn how to do that. And we need some, a little trig background, not a whole lot of trig background to be able to handle that, but I think you'll find it real interesting. What I want to do in the first segment today is I want to start off with going back to that triangle that we were fiddling around with and uh, both in the last two sessions. And I want to take a quick look at that and I have a handout that I gave you on it and I'll show it on the uh, computer or on the image on the recording here in a second. <clears throat> and then since solving equations is so important, I found a problem out of the textbook that I want us to go ahead and address that I think you'll find useful. And I'm trying to get you set up so that when you get into calculus, you'll kind of learn, you'll know how to use your algebra and your trig background to be able to use it in practical ways that you'll start seeing in calculus instead of waiting until you get in those courses to start seeing those practical applications. And then in that first segment, then we'll introduce the polar coordinate idea. And then uh, next segment, we'll actually take a look at polar equations how to jump between rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates, and then how to build the graphs, actual polar graphs. And then segment three will just be more playing around with polar graphs. So let's uh, take this triangle that we have so much fun with in the last couple sessions using law of sines and cosines. And here's what we had. We had, I believe, a length of 26 inches given to us. We had a length of 40 inches given, uh, 40 degrees, an angle of 40 degrees. And then on the other side of that angle was a 13 inch leg. So we had something that looked like this, something like that. And the final drawing is gonna look something like that. And I'll show, you, <coughs> I'll show you an image where I actually drew it to scale here in just a second. We, we then did a little bit of work, and I think we labeled this angle A, I believe. No, this is A up here. Angle A is up here. This, I think, was angle C. And then we had this side C over here that we found out, I believe it was 18.1 inches, approximately. Okay, so that's what we had. And then we did a little trigonometry. We then applied the law of sines. So let's look now on the, uh, on the overhead image of the law of sines where we take the sine of this angle A divided by 26 and then the sine of angle 40 degrees divided by its opposite side, 18.1. And we did that previously. And so what I have up here now is a scale drawing, a scale drawing of this. And I think this is large enough, I believe, to be readable on the, over, on the uh, recording. So here's a scale drawing with a, I used a protractor. I used a protractor here to build a 40 degree angle. You can see on the protractor, you may or may not be able to see this on the recording, <laughs> a 40 degree line. And then I used a, a scale and I then took the scaling and I laid out something equivalent to 26 inches here, scaled, and then half of that, 13, along that leg, and I built that triangle accurately. Then I measured, you can actually use the protractor then, and you can actually measure then this angle A up here at the top of this triangle and see that it's right around 112, 112 degrees. Now, here's the dilemma we had when we did this problem in class. Everybody with me so far? Okay. The dilemma we had in class is that we did this calculation. Here's what I mentioned a moment ago up on the board. The sine of A is to its opposite side as a ratio as the sine of 40 degrees is to its opposite side, 18.1. So that math is all correct using the law of sines. And then when you solve for angle A, you're gonna multiply both sides by 26, so it kicks the 26 up over here. And then you're gonna take the inverse sine of both sides to extract the angle A. 
So angle A then is going to be equal to the inverse sine of 26 sine of 40 over 18.1, the stuff you see right here. Now what I failed to do in class with you before is I did not actually calculate this ratio reading. With a calculator, <coughs> I did that, and it comes to be about 0.9233 in value. Everybody, feeling, everybody up with me? 0.9233. Now that value, if you think of your unit circle, that value, 0.9233, is the height on that unit circle. 0.9233, almost up to 1. And the answer you get, when, since this is a function in your calculator, what comes back in your calculator is only one answer, 67.4 degrees, which I previously tried to use and got the wrong result. So what you need to, you have to, you have to actually go through this step, and I failed to do that in class with you, is you then draw this and you go, oh, there's that angle, but then there's also the supplement to that angle, which would be 180 degrees minus that angle, 112.6 degrees has the same reading for the sine. Everybody with me on that? And the correct answer to, to use in this triangle is 112.6 degrees. What I did in this drawing, which is rather small here, is I drew the inverse sine function to show you where the 0.9233 is, and, and then the output value there is this 67.4 degrees, which is what the calculator gives you. So anyway, you need to select that 112.6 degrees to use for angle A. And you can see clearly on this drawing, a, a scale drawing, that that's an obtuse angle there and not an acute angle. So would you even need to do uh, sine A over 26? Yeah. Well, you have to do that problem. You have to do this calculation to be able to get this result here. And then you need to select the, the supplementary angle instead of the acute angle. But so how come, the one below. Yeah. how come when we use the law of cosines, we get the correct answer? Okay, that's a good, good question. Notice the range of angles here for the law of sines. The law of sines only lets you use angles between minus 90 degrees and 90 degrees for your output values. Mm -hmm. And your question's a really good one. And same thing with what Stormy just asked. If you look down here, here's what we did in class to be able to answer the question earlier is if we then had all three sides of our triangle known, which we did after our original calculation for the 18.1, if you come down and then use the law of cosines to find angle A, it's going to be the opposite side to the angle A, which is 26 squared, equals the sum of the squares of the other two legs minus twice the product of those other two legs times the cosine of that unknown angle. We then solve for that using an inverse cosine function. Is that all right with everybody? Okay. Using the inverse cosine function, however, here is your in inverse cosine graph over here. The inverse cosine has a range of angles from 0 degrees up to 180 degrees. What I did not draw here, which I think I will do, I'll tuck it in right here, is that unit circle that we've used before. Here's our unit circle, and the inverse cosine, remember, uses all these angles between 0 degrees and 180 degrees. So it captures all the possibilities for your cosine, which are your x readings here, all the possible cosine readings on that unit circle. And the, and the range of angles is from 0 to 180 degrees, so we're able to see both obtuse and acute angles. That's the reason that came out with the correct 112.6 degrees. Yeah, Emily? Is there a reason that if we know the 40 degrees and we know the 27.5 that we couldn't just add those together and minus them from 180? Yes, certainly. Yeah, if you knew the 40 and you'd been able to do this calculation and get that 27 and a half, sure, you could have done that and know then that that would be 112.6, right? Or 112.5 using that rounded off value, right? So there's different ways you can get at it, and that's what I'm trying to impress upon you, and also to impress upon you the importance, as you've seen in previous sessions, of drawing a sketch to be able to tell if you're either right or wrong. Okay, we beat that problem to death. Okay, let's go back to the board.
And I want to do one more thing with you that I have not emphasized. I did mention this previously on this law of sines and cosines, is this condition. If you're given an angle, an angle in a triangle, and then a side that's hooked to it, and then you just work your way around the triangle and you get the other side, and the book always writes it as SSA, as I've said before, for obvious reasons. They don't want to put that in the book. So let's say I give you an angle. Here's an angle. So here's a known angle. Let's call it angle A. And then let's say I'm going to work my way around this. So let's say this angle right here is, oh, 25 degrees. Looks roughly correct here. Let's say this thing is of length 42. Okay, of length 42. So we got an angle and an adjacent side, and then hooked on over here is another side. I want to hook another side on over here. Now let's say it's only 10. Let's say it's only 10 in length. If it's 10 in length, it might be, oh, roughly that long. And then it's got a hit to make a triangle, it's got to hit this leg, doesn't it? Well, look, if that thing is 10, I can sweep an arc, I can hold it here and make a, use a compass, right, and sweep an arc, and it doesn't ever get long enough to be able to hit this thing. This thing's called the ambiguous case. If it's too short, no triangle, no solution, okay, no solution. If it's, if it's too long, let's say, I'm not sure what length I would need, but let's say it's this long, then that would form a circular arc that might come in and hit here or here. Two possible triangles then, one looking here and one looking there. So you might get a little short leg there, this 42 here, and this leg right there. That'd be one possibility. And then the other possibility might be that triangle, something like that. Okay? All right, so again, now two answers possible here. Two answers. Now, I don't want to emphasize this too much because this does occur occasionally, but there's no need to really belabor it. Now, notice I took a leg that was too short, no answers, too long, two answers, and what if I took one that was just right, just came up and just nicked this missing leg? See that? What kind of triangle would that form? Now, if I made that just so it comes up and just nicks this edge right here, it would form a, it would come in tangent to this, wouldn't it? Right there? Come in tangent and be just right. Reminds me of the three bears. Too cold, too hot, just right. Okay? So that's why it's called the ambiguous case. And all you got to do is do the math, draw the sketch, and then work it out and then play with it until you're sure you got it right. Yeah, Emily? Uh, the ambiguous case is too short, so is the too long one, does that have any? No. Okay. <laughs> Potentially two answers. Now, if I made it really long, what if I made it longer than 42? Wouldn't that be possible? Couldn't I make it longer, hold it over here, and longer than 42, and there wouldn't be any answer coming down over here because it wouldn't use this angle, 25 degrees. But there'd only be one answer, and it'd be a big long thing going up over there. So all you do is just work it out, use the law, just work it out, and um, just make sure you've got it right when you're done. They're not too tough, you just gotta play with it. Okay, enough said about that. I spend more time on that subject than I really wanted to. Let's solve an equation. And it's a problem, it's a practical problem that's in the book. And they don't really have you develop it. I'm going to actually go through and develop this with you because that's what's really important, I think. This happens to be number question 65 in our textbook. 
on page 501. So what, we all have rain gutters in Oregon, okay? And so what we want to do is we want to make a rain gutter when the water comes off that roof, we want to be able to have it capture as much water as possible and then be able to flow that water out away from the house. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, and this is, we're going to use a particular numbers here, but we could generalize it. Let's say I have a sheet of sheet metal that is so wide. Let's say it's 12 inches wide. So I take a sheet, a piece of sheet metal that's 12 inches wide. And what are we going to do, and I don't know if you've ever seen these machines, or you can make it by hand. You take a, a long piece of sheet metal, and you take a certain width, and you bend it. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in off the ends a certain length symmetrically from both sides, and we're going to bend those outer legs up. We're going to bend them up at an angle. <coughs> so what we're going to get is something like this. And then this will be the side, this will be an end view looking in at the gutter, an end view looking in at the gutter. Now it should make sense to you that at a certain, you can, you can take a dimension here, oh, they want us to make these sidewalls four inches. So they want us to use exactly four inches here. I don't really like doing that. I'd rather use something other than exactly the same as that middle piece, but let's just stick with what the book says. So each of those legs are gonna be four, right? Okay. And what we want to do is bend those sides up, bend those sides up in such a way that we create the maximum cross-sectional area. And that should make sense to you. Then it's going to have the largest carrying capacity for the rainwater coming off the roof into this thing, and then you run it down to the end and down the downspout. So we want to know what angle we should bend these outer edges up at. What angle should we bend those outer edges up to create the largest cross-sectional area? the largest cross-sectional area. Okay. Now, what shape is that in your geometry? It's a trapezoid. You have two parallel sides, and the other two sides are not parallel. So this is a regular trapezoid because it's symmetric. It's called a regular trapezoid. Okay. Here's a little, little thing from geometry to help you remember a uh, formula for the area of that thing. If you take a trapezoid, let's say I do something like this, a little short leg here, longer leg over here. This is an irregular looking one, Par two parallel sides though, right? If you take this thing and you go, oh, boy, what's the equation for the area of that? If I take this thing and I make another one of these, I cut out another one with a sheet of paper, mm -hmm. and I turn it upside down and turn it around. Couldn't I lay it, let's label this A and B, with some height H right there. If I make another one of those and I cut it out and I turn it around, I could lay it up here. So this now becomes that leg B upside down there. And then I get out here a ways, and then A is going to be here, and then B goes about that far, right? So here's another one of them cut out, turned upside down, turned around, right? What shape is this thing now? The whole parallelogram. Thing? Thank you, parallelogram. The opposite sides are parallel to one another, parallelogram. Now, if I took and then cut this little triangle, snipped this little triangle off right over here, and took it over and laid it on right there, then I would make it into a rectangle, wouldn't I? I'd have a rectangle that would look like this, wouldn't I? Where this is A plus B and the height is H. Right? And you know what the area of that is. See how you take yourself back to ground zero? So the area of this rectangle now 
you know is length times width, right? Mm -hmm. But the trapezoid is really how much of that? Mm -hmm. Half of that. Half of that. So your trapezoid formula is half of the height times the sum of the parallel sides. I don't remember this formula. Well, actually, I do because <laughs> I've done it enough. <laughs> but, you know, if I was away from this stuff for a year or two, I might not remember this formula, but I remember how to get it if I need it. And I've been trying to do that as we've gone through trig with you as well. So we've got our trapezoid up here. So it looks like to get the area, we have to write a formula for this area of this trapezoid. Right? Mm -hmm. So the area of the trapezoid is going to be the height. Now, what's the height of this thing? Don't say it out loud. Think. What's that height? This length is 4. That's angle theta. It, isn't this, isn't that 4 times the sine of theta? Because that's the opposite side. If this was of only length 1, you'd be on your unit circle, wouldn't you? If that was of length 1, you'd be on a unit circle. And the height there would be the sine of that angle theta, wouldn't it? Where my finger is, that little height. If I scale this thing up to 4, I'm going to be multiplying that sine of theta times 4, aren't I? Mm -hmm. So this length right here is 4 sine theta. So that height is 4 sine theta. And I need to divide that by 2, right? And now I have to add these the, bay, the two parallel links together. The two parallel links together. Is everybody with me so far? I have to add the parallel links. So I have this bottom piece here as 4. I like that one. And I need to add to it this long length up here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh boy, I wonder what that is. Well, look. If I took this thing and did this, that center piece of it is 4, right there, obviously. And then what I need to do is to add on these two symmetric pieces, don't I? But those two symmetric pieces are right here, aren't they? And similar to the way we, I just talked you, talked you into getting this height right here is 4 sine theta, this leg between my thumb and finger R is, if it was a unit circle, a little tiny unit circle here where my, between my fingers with a hypotenuse there of 1, we know between my fingers and thumb, finger and thumb is cosine theta. And if I scale that up to a length 4, that's going to multiply this cosine theta here by 4. So I have 4 cosine theta right there. And I have that length, and then I have another pair, another one of those over here. So I have two of those, don't I? Mm -hmm. Plus twice 4 cosine theta. So here is an equation for the cross-sectional area. An equation for the cross-sectional area. So the cross-sectional area of our rain gutter then, as a function of the variable theta, is going to be this thing. All right? Now, there's a little bit of arithmetic here. The 2 reduces into the 4 twice. Mm -hmm. And then there's a common, notice there's a common 4 over here that could factor out. So I believe we're going to end up with 8 sine theta times 1 plus to cos theta. Is the arithmetic correct? The factoring process, which you need to be good at? Okay, I'm going to write down what the book has here in a second. Did I do any 
Did I make any mistakes here? Because you know I do make mistakes. <laughs> There's a common four here. Pull that out if you wish. Four times four would be 16 divided by two is eight. Sine theta. After factoring the four out, it leaves a one plus two cosine theta. Okay, now the book says the equation is cosine two theta plus cosine theta. No, actually they have 16 sine theta, cosine theta plus one. I'm not sure if they're right or I'm right, mm -hmm. or who's wrong. Emily, Why see an error? Why are there two four sine thetas if there's two four cosine thetas? There aren't two. There's one of them right here. That's the height. The height divided what by two. What about the one on oh. the other side? The other triangle? Back here? No, so there's... Two triangles in that. So why doesn't that one count? Well, you're only using the height. There's only oh, one okay. for the the height is four sine theta. Half of the height, here's the height, divided by half of the height, times the sum of the, the two legs. So four plus that. So let's go ahead and keep going here, see what happens. So we do get 16 sine theta, cosine theta plus eight sine theta, if I do the distribution, right? If I do the distribution, is that okay? And this is something I drew to your attention in a previous session, but it's hard to keep all this stuff in your head. Here's what I mentioned before. Twice, or excuse me, the sine, here's your double angle formula that I asked you to memorize. Here's your double angle formula. Frequently I mentioned that if you ever see products of sine and cosine, <coughs> you can think of that as the sine of twice the angle divided by two sine of twice the angle divided by two. So we could come into this formula over here and we could rewrite it, and that's not a 1.6, 16. I can replace the sine theta cos theta with sine of twice theta over two. So I'd have 16 sine of twice theta over two plus eight sine theta, which turns out to be eight sine of twice theta plus eight sine theta. Now this is a superposition formula, like I talked about previously, where we have one sine wave and we're adding some other function to it. We're adding functions together. This is different than what you see in the book. The book gives you an equation, an alternative equation, which is just derived in a different fashion I'm not going to take the time to go through it, but it's 16 sine theta times cos theta plus 1. And, oh, I'm sorry, I wrote it wrong. Six, no, that's what they wrote, yeah. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to go ahead and solve this and see if these things end up agreeing with one another. Because remember what our original objective is? The original objective is to maximize the cross-sectional area. Any questions so far? I believe the work we've done here is correct. Am I sure? 100% sure? I'm not 100% sure until I try it and actually see what happens with it. And the book offered this equation to describe that area. Okay. 
So what I want to do now is take this and go ahead and generate its graph real quickly. And then we'll end this second segment, and then we'll do the polar during the next segment. So what I'm going to do is put the calculator in degree mode. So I'm in degree mode. I'm then going to go to y equals. And I'm going to come in here and take the equation that we came up with, which is 8 sine of twice the angle. And we're going to add to it 8 sine of the angle. Okay, so here's our equation. We're then going to take and build a viewing window in degree measure. So you can imagine folding up those edges, folding up those edges and at some angle theta. So you'd expect theta to be in a range of angles from 0 to 90 degrees, right? 0 to 90 degrees. So let's do that, 0 to 90 degrees and say put tick marks every 10 degrees. And then vertically is going to represent the cross-sectional area. Now, what if the sides were straight up? If the sides were straight up, what would the area be? Be 4 high and 4 wide on the base, right? It'd be an area cross-sectional area of 16. So that gives us a sense of a magnitude to lay in for our y values here. So why don't I go, say, negative 5 to 20 and put tick marks every 5? Just so I have a little space to work with there those six numbers. Got it? Let's draw the graph. Is that a parabola? If you just looked at that graph, you might say, oh, that's a parabola. Is that a parabola? <coughs> Hell no. Okay. It's a trigonometric function, isn't it? Okay. So it's not. So let's now turn on the calculate feature and seek the maximum. So we go on our trace key. We go second function, calculate. We're going to look for maximum, number four. And remember how we do this? We pick a left bound. And so I just look at my scaling here. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. I might say 40. And I might say a right bound of 70. So left bound of 40. Right bound of 70. And it's asking for a guess in this interval between those little arrows up here. Let's, let's guess 60 and have it do the work. And it's a numerical solver. And it comes up with a maximum occurring at 53.6 degrees. And the maximum area is 14.1 square inches. So what I'm going to do is write that up on the board. So we get at 53.6 degrees an approximate maximum area reading of 14.1 square inches. And this is about equal to our maximum area. Why would you just fold it at 90? Wouldn't if you that fold make it at 16 inches square? Oh, that's interesting. Which is a higher maximum area, which oh. seems like it would flow more water. Yeah, maybe so doesn't. what we did, we, we thought about this before we punched it. And that area would be 16 square inches. Mm -hmm. So what does that make you, does that build confidence in our equation that I derived with you? No. 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 We lack confidence in it. Does that make me nervous? Yes. Yes? <laughs> okay. Okay. So there's something fishy here. Now let me take the equation that they gave us in the book. Let's take the equation from the book and quickly use the same window setting that we did and just pop this equation in and see what it tells us. So taking the equation that they gave us in the book 
which happened to be, let me just clear that thing, 16 sine of the angle times the quantity cosine of the angle plus 1. Right? So there it is. And if we hit graph on that one, oh, it's going off the top. Okay, I'm going to kill it because what did I set for my window settings? Oh, 20. No, oh, interesting. Wow. Let me make it 25 just for the fun of it. It looked like I was going off the top there. Now let's let it roll. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. It's, it looks like it's in the same region, but look at this area. is up higher than 16. 5, 10, 15, 16 is down in here. This area, cross-sectional area at some lesser angle than 90 degrees, is giving us a maximum area up here. So if I run the max feature real quickly on that, left bound, 40, 70 for right bound, guess 60, and it comes back with an alternative answer for us. This one looks wrong. So at 60 degrees, 60 degrees we're coming up with a maximum area of 20, whatever it is, 20.8 square inches. Okay, so notice how we used our brain to see that something was fishy with that original work we did. I went back and used the book. Your, your problem is to take the work I did and find the mistake. And let me know by tomorrow. Okay, if you happen to be watching the D, I don't want to hear about it now. I want you guys individually to go figure it out and find that mistake and come back and see me. If you happen to be watching the DVD, come in and see me after you watch the DVD, figure out the mistake. Okay. Now, the question is, did I do it on purpose, or did I do it by accident? <laughs> I'm not, not going to say. Okay. Let's end that segment, and then we'll get on to the next one. Ready? Okay. So we're on for segment two. So I took a little longer with the trig equation stuff in the last segment than I wanted to. I wanted to get on into this polar coordinates. This is going to be very straightforward for you if you understand the fundamentals. If we took an Standard angle. Remember, standard angles are measured counterclockwise from the x-axis, as I've shown here. So standard angle, some angle theta, with a hypotenuse length of 1. Then you know that the height right here is can be represented as what? Sine of theta. Sine of theta. And this adjacent leg right here is the cosine of theta. And it wouldn't matter what angle I gave you, would it? It could be over in the second quadrant, down in the third quadrant, and so forth. It wouldn't matter. And you could take that. Let me, let me do this. And, and I wanna, the reason I want to do this is I want to encourage you to always draw it. When they tell you you have a second quadrant angle, folks, or a third or fourth quadrant angle, draw it this way. Draw the angle this way. That angle theta, if they say it's second quadrant, is not here. It's not this little guy. Angle theta is this guy. And the height right here is, if that's a 1, that height is going to be the sine of that angle. 
in this X reading, it'll be negative in this case, that's going to be your cosine of that angle. You all know that. Fundamentals. If I scale this hypotenuse length by something other than 1 and called it R, then these two triangles are similar. They're cl clearly similar. Same angle in here. Just scaling the hypotenuse length to some other value called R. Could be longer than 1, could be shorter than 1. So, if you scale it by that factor, what's this height over here? R sine theta. R sine theta, just like you saw when we played with the trapezoid. Right? Okay. So this is going to be R sine theta. This leg right here is R cosine theta, by the same reasoning. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the thing, this new thing called polar coordinates. What you are used to is having an axis drawn this way representing positive x. And you know that positive values for x go out that way. Negative values go opposite from this pole. This is called the pole. Right? Positive x's go that way. Negative x's go off to the left. Similarly, in Y, positive Y readings are measured from the pole upward. Negative Y readings are measured downward. You've been doing that since beginning algebra. What we're doing here in trigonometry now is we're coming out and taking some point located out here in the traditional XY form, right? And that pins down a spot, doesn't it? And those are your rectangular coordinates that you're used to. Rectangular coordinates. That pins down a spot. I could, I could figure out this distance r, couldn't I? If I knew the xy? And you've done this ever since you started algebra. Actually, almost pre-algebra, Pythagorean theorem, right? So where this you know is your x and that's your y, and you can find your r by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the legs. Easy. Everything's easy so far. This angle right here, theta, can we find it if you knew just the x and the y? If you knew the x and y, you knew this location, couldn't you find that theta? What ratio would you use? Y over X, rise over run, Y over X, opposite over adjacent, right? Tangent of the angle theta. So the tangent of angle theta, I'm going to go over here, tangent of angle theta is Y over X, by definition, right? So the angle theta. Is the inverse tangent of Y over X? Inverse tangent, as Raphael said, the inverse tangent of that ratio y over x. So what, we, what you can do, if you know your familiar rectangular coordinates, you can translate them into a radius distance from the pole and an angle theta. And that'll, that'll land you right on that location. If you knew this r and this theta value, wouldn't that land you right on that spot? Right? What if I said 30 degrees? And I said, go out there five meters. Standard angle, 30 degrees. Here's my arm, 30 degrees, and go out there five meters. Right? Doesn't that pin down the spot just as well as you tell me telling you the x coordinate and the y coordinate? The r and the theta are called polar coordinates. It's not that hard. Polar coordinates. Memorize this picture. Make a poster. Put it on the ceiling above your bed. Okay. You ready to practice polar now? Okay. Sketch or, or locate 
on a little sketch the following. Five, 250 degrees. If you see something written this way, understand that that's polar. <laughs> Time's up. Got it? All you got to do is draw a little spot somewhere on this picture. You're going to lay out the 250 degree angle. Here's your 250 degrees. And you're going to go out there a distance from the pole, a distance of five. Boom, here it is, right there. Got it? Not that tough. Try this one. Negative five, 250 degrees. Have fun. Negative five, 250 degrees. What quadrant are you in? First quadrant. Who's puzzled? Who's puzzled? How could R be a negative number? Oh, because it's right there. That's what it says. Okay. I'm glad you asked that, Marty. What if you're back here in the familiar world of x and y? What if I said plot negative 5 for x? Where would you go? Second quadrant. So you're going to go back over to the left here, aren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Now, what I'm getting at, the reason and I, w I want, wanted you to be a little puzzled by this, is what I'm getting at is you set your angle, and that gives you the direction of an axis. That gives you a defined direction of an axis terminal side, a radial axis. The positive sense of that radial axis is this way, is this direction. You pick this angle, you set this angle, and from the pole pointing as a ray outward in that direction is the positive axis. If they give you a negative 5, you just go back up that axis in a negative direction, just like you do with x and y if you have negative x's or negative y's. And I don't know if you remember when you first, I don't remember when I first learned this rectangular stuff, but I know I, I tutor enough people, help enough people at the beginning algebra level, they have a hard time plotting stuff, positives and negatives, in just a rectangular coordinate system. Sometimes when you first see this in trig, it seems confusing. So what you do is you define the direction of your axis, and then, and then you, go in the, you go that distance. Negative 5 is going to take you back up here. So here's where negative 5, comma, 250 degrees sits. So if we weren't shown the positive 5 first, then we were just shown the negative 5? Yeah. Then you'd have to know. You're still, you, you set your angle, okay. and then you take the walk from oh, the pole. Oh, I see. And then you're like, oh. You take, set your angle. Okay. That's like your compass heading, sort of. And then you take a walk. Yeah, in this case, you're going to go negative 5 back up there. Now, is that the most convenient way to write this point location? No. You'd probably prefer to write it as positive 5, comma. This is 250 degrees. And this is 180 to here, right? 180. Isn't that 70 degrees right down in here? Isn't that 70 degrees right there? Mm -hmm. Right? And so that means this is 70 degrees sitting right in here, right? So it looks like it would be a lot more convenient for you to write it as 570 degrees as the location. So how about uh, negative 5, negative 250? That'd be in uh, quadrant 4. Well, I don't want anybody to get a headache. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Three, four. 
negative 5, negative 250 degrees. Where do you, where do you start with? Angle. Angle. Yeah. Negative 250. So then negative 5. So you're pointing R out this way, aren't you? Uh -huh. Here's your negative 250 degrees. And then you're going to take a walk from the pole in the negative R direction. Yeah. So you're going to come down here and plot this point right down here. There it is. Fourth quadrant. Okay. Your angles can be positive and neg or ne or negative, and the le and the R's can be positive or negative. It's cleanest, obviously, to have both of them positive. Right. So the preferred way to write this answer here would be to use this positive angle, right? <coughs> and let's see, this little angle in here again is 70 degrees, which means that this little angle in here is 70 degrees, which would be 290 degrees as a positive angle and a positive radius of 5. <coughs> Remember. In trigonometry, there are an infinite number of results possible, aren't there, usually? Because of the periodic character of these functions. These, the periodic character of these functions. Same thing ends up coming up here when you start doing polar coordinates. OK, so that's how you plot a point. Now, how do you now start writing an equation that is in polar form? So we need to make sure we touch on that. that any, que any further questions on how to plot a point? Because you've got to know how to plot a point to be able to go forward on this. Okay. Just like in algebra back in the rectangular world, you needed to understand how to plot points before you went on and started doing algebra of lines or parabolas or other algebraic functions. All right? Okay. So what you want to try to memorize is that R is, you have that little image in your head of that triangle with the R and the theta and the X and the Y. That's all you've got to have in your head, and you already know that. So R could be represented as the square root of X squared plus Y squared. The angle theta could be the inverse tangent of y over x. Now, you also have to have your brain engaged here. Everybody see this? Brain. Brain. OK. You have to think, because what can happen, you know that tangent, tangent of an angle occurs every 180 degrees, doesn't it? So you have to think of where is that, where are those x, y locations? And you know that the inverse tangent function only gives you one result if you're going to punch it on a calculator, right? It's only going to give you one angle out, one angle coming out of this. And you know there could be another angle that's 180 degrees off from that. So how are you going to catch what to do with your brain? Get the one angle and subtract 180 degrees, and then you got them both. And then figure out which, which one fits. And how are you going to figure that out, Raphael? How are you going to figure out which one to fit? Based which on one to choose? Based on wise, whether they're negative or positive. Okay. And I'm looking for the artistic side of this. Oh. Draw, draw, a, draw a picture. picture. Yeah. Always draw a picture. Okay. If you draw that XY location, you'll know what angle you better be aiming for, right? Draw the picture and you'll get it. Okay. This is how, if you know rectangular, <coughs> how to translate into polar. This is how you go from the rectangular world to get your polar world. Make sense? What if you have the polar stuff given to you instead, and you want to go into the rectangular world? It's programmed in your calculator? No, it's in your, <laughs> it's in your brain. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. it's this little picture. Here's the picture that gives you your relationships. Right? That simple. That thing gives you your relationships right there. So 
if you know the polar, if you know the r theta, we want to get back to x and y. So if you know r and theta, how are you going to get x? Uh, r times yeah, x is r cosine theta, isn't it? And isn't y r sine theta? That's the translation you've got to go through. So if you know r and theta, then you're going to calculate your x by taking r cosine of theta, and you're going to calculate the y by taking r sine of theta. OK, so what I've shown you is how to translate things from rectangular to polar or polar to rectangular. So if I gave you, with no calculator, just your brain, for an exact value, let's say I wanted the exact values, I want the exact x, y, knowing the polar coordinates 7, 240 degrees. The exact x, y, knowing 7, 240 degrees. First thing you're going to do is? Draw a picture. Thank you. Draw a picture. looking for the x and the y here. Okay. Time's up. Got it? Almost. Sine 240, you know that. Mm -hmm. Minus a half, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the sine of 240, negative square root of 3 over 2. So your answers for x exactly are minus 7 halves, and your y is negative 7 radical 3 over 2. Textbooks will use your 16 common angles to keep refreshing your memory on the trig ratios of them to be able to extract exact answers. Feel good? Okay. So what I've given you is how to take and translate rectangular into polar form and how to translate polar into rectangular form and figure out coordinates. So let's go ahead and um, <coughs> end, end this segment, and then we'll start the last segment where we're going to start focusing on translating equations and coming up with polar graphs. Okay, yes, go ahead. What's the calculus for the test? Oh, the, the, the exam coming up next Tuesday will cover up through the last session. In the last session, we did law signs and cosines and oscillations, oscillations <coughs> harmonic models, simple harmonic models, which you've seen actually earlier in the course as well. So that's what the test will cover, and your homework will cover up through uh, this homework on polar.
because I want you to keep going on this homework though. So turn the homework notebooks in also next Tuesday. Okay, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Okay, let's talk now about polar equations and graphs. Okay, so first of all, let's look at polar equations. Let's see, if I gave you this equation in algebra, x squared plus y squared equals 36, you all would say that's a complicated equation or a simple equation? Simple. Simple. What is it as a shape, drawing, what? graph? What? It's a circle, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared, a circle of radius 6, right? Mm -hmm. Easy and simple. At this point in the town, at this point in time, for you, right? Easy and simple. About as basic as it gets for something nonlinear. Okay, so a nice simple circle. Okay. Now, before I go any further with you, and here's what you should remember: x, y, and six. That relationship is sitting right here. Okay. Before I go any further with you, let me just ask you this y equals 3. That's pretty simple too, isn't it? What's that graph like? A horizontal line. A horizontal line up at y equals 3, right? Right? y equals 3. Simple. Very simple. Okay. What's x in this equation? What's x? Well, that's one spot. Any real number, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't x any real number? Even though it's not explicitly stated in this equation, x can be any real number, right? And that gives you this family of points, an infinite family of points, right? Okay, now here's your thing you're memorized to help you do translation from rectangular to polar, right? Where this is x and this is y, right? So if I want to translate this equation from its rectangular form into its polar, here's its rectangular form, and I want to translate it to its polar form, x squared plus y squared is equivalent to what? Look at that picture. X squared plus y squared is? R squared. R squared. <laughs> fast, okay, right? X squared plus y squared is R squared, right? So when you see an equation in rectangular form, you can replace x squared plus y squared with R squared, couldn't you? Well, let's say you didn't even see that, which apparently some of you just didn't see, okay? Right? But you do know you can replace x with what to go to get the polar? What can you replace x with? R cosine, r cosine theta. And you could replace the y in here with r sine theta, right? Mm -hmm. So just let's just step on in there and do it. So we're going to come into our equation here, and we're going to replace x with r cosine theta and y with r sine theta. So we're going to get r cosine theta quantity squared plus r sine theta quantity squared equals 36, right? Clean this up a little bit, and don't you see a common r squared here that could be factored out? Mm -hmm. And what's left would be a cosine squared theta plus a sine squared theta, which that product then is equal to 36. But we know that cos squared plus sine squared is 1. So r squared equals 36. r equals plus or minus 6. But what I would probably select is just r equals 6. Now tell me, 
which equation is simpler? r equals 6 or x squared plus y squared equals 36? <laughs> What's theta down here? What's theta in this equation? I'm going to put the equation up over here. r equals 6. What's theta? Y over x. Think about it. What's theta? My arm is 6 long. What's theta? Any angle. Any angle. Right? Go back down here for a second. Y equals 3. What's X? Any real number, right? No, nothing different going on. Come up here. R equals 6. What's that telling you about theta? Theta is all real, all real numbers or all possible angles. What kind of shape do you get? A circle. The radius 6. Any theta. Actually, all theta. OK. So things that lend themselves to some kind of circular symmetry, things, shapes that lend themselves to circular type of symmetry, some type of symmetry in a circular fashion, are going to be best represented or more simply represented in a polar form, in a polar form. Things like an airplane propeller, the prop on a speedboat, the petals of a flower, OK? Other types of shapes, like ellipses and so forth, lend themselves very nicely to a polar representation. And then the using, translating them into that format and then using that mathematics on them is a lot easier. And, and doing the mathematical processes when you're in a polar format is a lot simpler than doing it back in the rectangular world, in the XY world. OK, so this is how you translate an equation. You simply use the st information that's right in this little picture here to translate from rectangular into polar, or vice versa, or vice versa. So let's do the reverse. And we'll get to the graphs here in a second. Let's go from a polar form back to a rectangular form. Polar form back to a rectangular form. OK, so let's see. How about writing an equation R equals four sine of theta. R equals four sine theta. Do you have your triangle memorized with x, y, r, theta in it? What can you replace r with in rectangular? What can you replace r with? Uh, square root of x plus y. X squared, uh, right? X squared Radical plus y squared. of x squared plus y squared, right? Yeah. What can you replace sine theta with? From your original definition, y over y over r, right? From the triangle, from the triangle, y over r <coughs> for sine theta. Well, r, if I multiply both sides by r, I'm going to end up seeing the square of this then, the square of the square root, aren't I? And I'm just going to be getting x squared plus y squared equals 4y. If I multiply both sides by r, and r happens to be the square root, so I have the square root times the square root gives, gives me x squared plus y squared. Ready with me? Okay, it's kind of fun. What can we do to this? I'm taking you back to the first week in college algebra. 
You can divide, isolate the y, the y that's not squared yet, by dividing x squared plus y squared by 4. Nope. Because uh, you got your variables in both places here, actually in three locations. Here's what you got to do. You move it all over to one side. Oh, that's right. Factor it out. All right? Yep. Then you make a factor. Now, ah, what's well, this remind you of? What process? Don't forget it, which some of you have. <laughs> You've got to complete the square. Oh, yeah. <laughs> College algebra, first week. <laughs> You've got to complete the square. Quick refresher. You have a quadratic expression here in y, right? You take half of the linear coefficient, which is negative 2. I suggest you write it down and circle it. Do what with it? Remember what to do with this? No, you don't remember? Square it. <laughs> Square negative 4 and you get plus 4. Tuck it in right there. Remember this? Is it dusting off the cobwebs? Take half the linear coefficient, square it, put it in here. Uh-oh, I just added 4 to the left side of the equation. To keep things balanced, let me go over on the other side of the equation and also add 4. Now it's still balanced, isn't it? And the beauty of what we just did, now we created this trinomial that is a binomial square. Lots of good vocabulary here. So we have x squared plus y minus 2 quantity squared, a binomial square, using the negative 2 again, equals 4, or 2 squared over there. What shape is this? First week college algebra. A circle. Thank you. A circle that is, has a center at zero, positive two, and a radius of two. Rectangular equation, polar equation. Which one's simpler, folks? If you remember your algebra, you probably like this because this thing is new. Okay? Now watch this. This is where we sort of blow our minds on this, okay? This gets to be good. Okay. How do you take. <laughs> How do you take this equation and draw that circle? How do you take this polar equation and draw that circle? This gets exciting. I gave all of you a little handout. I'm going to throw one of them on the computer screen here so people can see it if they're watching the recording. Check this out. I'm going to enlarge this so people can see this. There we are. This is called polar graph paper. And the reason I have my fingers on it is because it's kind of, actually, it'll sit there okay. It's still readable. Okay, this is called polar graph paper. Here, notice your angles shown. Again, I talked earlier about you set your angles, right? You come up with your angle. You set your angle. You set your angle, whatever it happens to be. And then from the pole, you travel outward in the direction of that unless the radius is negative. Then you go the opposite direction. Okay? With me? So you can actually use this paper. and You can, you can Xerox this or copy this and then blow it up and then actually use this to do polar problems for drawing pictures. So let's come back up to the board. How do you do this with just pencil and regular paper? 
I forgot to bring my stick with me today. I'm going to just use my arm. So, back in the first chapter of this course, we learned how to draw sine waves. You could draw this picture very easily, couldn't you? If I say plot R that way and theta this way, that's just a plain old sine wave with, a, with an amplitude of four, right? Mm -hmm. So you just draw it. And I might draw it through more than one cycle. Okay. This represents the radius. And so as we're letting the angle sweep from zero degrees to 180 degrees, we're going to get a peak radius reading at 90 degrees. Of four. Of four, right? And then, as you go from 180 degrees towards 360 degrees, you're going to be having negative radiuses. Do you see how this all ties together with stuff I talked about earlier? Mm -hmm. Now, watch my arm. If I have my, my, this arm right here is my base. That's my positive x-axis, right, from which I measure my angles. So, when theta is zero degrees with my marker, when theta is zero degrees, What's my radius? What do you see there? Zero. Zero. When I get to 90 degrees, here's my polar graphing going on. What's happening as I let my radius, as, as I let my radius axis rotate? My angles are growing, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Towards 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. And what's happening to the radius as I go towards 90 degrees here? Look at that picture. It's going up to its peak. The radius is growing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So imagine a little slider here on my arm, a nice little bracelet. Okay? Now, as my arm is rotating and the angle keeps changing, my bracelet is slipping outward, right? It's getting longer, isn't it? See these link links getting longer? Those links are getting longer until when I get to 90 degrees, my radius, my bracelet is clear up here at four. Make sense? <laughs> then what happens when I go past 90 degrees now? I'm gonna step over which way there. When I go past 90 degrees now, What's happening to that bracelet, that radius? It's dropping. <coughs> Look right here. It's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. The same way that it was growing before 90 degrees, right? You see the symmetry here? See the symmetry? To either side of 90 degrees there? So you're going to expect to see that when you draw this polar graph. Now check out this picture. Here's my radiuses. Here's my radial axis, like with my arm and the bracelet. And that radius is slipping outward as I move outward here. The radius is getting longer and longer and longer until when I'm at 90 degrees, the radius is longest of length four. I go past 90 degrees, and my radius vectors are pointing outward from the center here, from the pole, and the bracelet is getting shorter the radius is getting shorter as I head towards 180 degrees. So I, I like to call this thing the rectangular plot. And books don't show that for some reason. They give you all kinds of formulas and all kinds of weird things to memorize. And I can't memorize that stuff. I do this. I, this takes us back to the beginning of the course beginning of the course, and then we just use this to help us translate ourselves into this polar world. And we end up with this shape. Now, in 30 seconds, watch this. You're going to love it. Back to the calculator screen real quickly. Be done here in just a moment. I don't want you to rely on what I'm going to show you right now until after you're pretty good by doing this stuff by hand like I showed you in class. So here's, here's something you can do. You can take your calculator, and I'm going to keep it in degree mode, and I'm going to come down here to on my mode screen, and I'm going to go over here to polar mode, polar mode. So I select polar, and then I'm going to hit y equals, and look at what my y equals screen now looks like. R equals 4 sine. I hit my X key, but look at what it punched. Yeah. It now treats it as the letter theta, as my independent variable. 
I now go to the window settings, right? You do your Y equals first. You now go to your window settings and look at this. I have the choice, I have the control. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to turn the base on here. For the recording, here's the R equals. After I changed into the polar mode, when I got to there from this, right here, I activate polar mode, I go to Y equals, I then come to the control here, and how far do I need to go on my angles to get the graph? 180 degrees is what we said a moment ago. And I'm gonna do graphing every five degrees. And then down here now, we have the control over the angles up here. Down below, we have our window settings. So I'm now gonna set a window that is negative six to six, one, and vertically negative two to five, one. You got those numbers written down, those six numbers? Negative six, six, one, negative two, five, one. And then I hit graph and I'm gonna pause it as it goes. I just paused it. What angle are we about at right here? At that point? 60? Probably up around 50, 60 degrees, right? Yeah. You with me? So we're moving from zero to 180 degrees and it's calculating the R value and then it's plotting the points for us. There's the picture. It's not a function, is it? It's a polar function, but as a rectangular function, it's not a function. Or as a rectangular relationship, it's not a function, is it? Okay, so it doesn't pass a vertical line test, but it is a polar function. And then when you turn trace on, here's your traditional stuff, X and Y. So you can move to 45 degrees and see what the X readings are and Y readings, all right? Also, you can go to format, look at this, format up on the zoom key, and you can go to polar graphing coordinates right there and hit graph and trace. And let's say I go to 60 degrees. 60 degrees, here's your radius, here's your 60 degrees. The radius happens to be 3.46, and you're at 60 degrees. Okay, enough said for today. Have fun with that. <laughs>